It's on tonight. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the health track of Chacha 2021, forgotten amidst pandemic. In sync with the overall theme of Chacha 2021, we will be bringing together experts in the field, the thought leaders, and various stakeholders to reflect upon our responses during the crisis. But having a very forward-looking plan to weave a plan that will help the nation to be resilient and also ensure that we leave no one behind. The health track has been curated by Piramal Swastya team. On behalf of the team, I welcome you all. We are overwhelmed to have Professor Srinath Reddy with us today. Professor Reddy is the president of Public Health Foundation of India. He is a Padma Bhushan recipient, the third highest civilian award by the president of India. He has been a public health advisor to various state governments and also has served as physician to two prime ministers of India. Welcome, Professor Reddy. I request you to address the audience. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be part of this gathering, which is looking at some of the critical issues in our health system performance in terms of addressing the very many priorities that we have set for ourselves and we continue to focus our attention on even during this particular pandemic. If we are really looking at what has happened to the various health needs of the people before COVID-19, besides COVID-19, even as the pandemic is in progress, and beyond COVID-19, when we hope we'll emerge out of the pandemic with a renewed commitment to a broader health agenda, then we must recognize that there are several issues that need to be addressed not only from the health system perspective, but also from the broader determinants of health. And I'm happy that the agenda of this particular conclave is indeed addressing very many of those areas which have now gone into neglect as a result of our preoccupation with the COVID pandemic, and also looking at some of the other determinants of health, which do need to be taken into account in the broader context of our health agenda. Indeed, we have set several ambitious targets and we have made several commitments in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals of 2015, to which we subscribed. And we reiterated a broad commitment to a vision of comprehensive primary health care, as well as efficient and equitable health services to all of the people on a platform of universal health coverage in our national health policy of 2017. We, we even set a broader agenda <coughs> to the goals that were adopted in the Millennium Development Goals, where apart from maternal and child health, we added reproductive, neonatal, <coughs> of course, which was there earlier, but also adolescent health services in a very prominent way. Then we made that into an RMN CH plus A program. We add non-communicable diseases, mental health, road traffic injuries, and we also brought in substance abuse. So in a sense, we brought in a much broader health agenda, addressing very many needs of the people. But through the Sustainable Development Goals, and partly through our national health policy, we also connected it to the social and environmental determinants of health and pledged to take concerted action on all of them in order to deliver on the targets. In some ways, we even set ourselves more ambitious targets than what the SDGs demanded of us by saying that we would actually eliminate tuberculosis by year 2025, well 
ahead of the 30 target set by the Sustainable Development Goals. But we would have really recognized that all of this needed a primary healthcare-led United uh, uh, Universal Health Coverage Service. We needed commitment to social determinants of health, and we needed a very active, enabled community engagement. We should have been progressing on that road, but for the COVID pandemic. But even prior to COVID, we found that in many of these areas, our performance was less than what we should have been witnessing. In a sense, we had suboptimal performance and because of multiple reasons, because of markedly deficient public investment in health, because of a deficient health workforce, deficient in numbers, and to some extent in skills, we had a disconnected health service between the public and the private sectors and between different levels of care. And we had virtually no real portable universal health coverage system operating across the country, across all parts of the country. Some beginnings were made, quite laudable, but they had not crystallized into a platform of universal health coverage or a pathway to health for all across the entire life course. Therefore, it's very clear that we need a very efficient and equitable health system functioning in the steady state, even to combat the specific needs of a public health emergency when we have to be capable of a strong and swift surge response to the emergency. So when we are confronted with an emergency like that of COVID-19, if we have a relatively weak health system in place, our ability to respond despite our grit and determination is still going to be inadequate from the purpose of providing the best possible response. Of course, we have seen several of the well-endowed health systems across the world also challenged and some of them tottering under the onslaught of the COVID pandemic. But many of them have recouped and several of them have exhibited considerable strength in what they have done subsequently. For example, if you look at the United Kingdom, they faltered very badly in the initial stages of the pandemic, particularly in 2020, in containing the pandemic, partly because they ignored their own national health service, but and they went in for some peculiar private sector procurement, which proved to be fairly faulty over there. But when it came to vaccination, it was not merely the production volumes. The fact that they brought the NHS strongly into the picture and engaged their NHS practitioners, the GPs and others, in ensuring that people got vaccinated as per the priority list with appropriate appointments. And the fact that the people had confidence in the system and reported for the vaccination rather than protesting against it, like in parts of the United States of America, showed that system actually worked. So you do really require a very strong health system functioning, particularly on the base of a very structured primary health care. And if you do not have that, then our emergency response becomes deficient. And we have also seen how even our secondary healthcare facilities have faltered because of lack, lack of oxygen. Why only secondary healthcare, even the advanced tertiary care institutions also fell short of the required level of combat readiness for the pandemic. So we have seen how best hospitals have functioned with great difficulty, but how many hospitals have faltered and failed to deliver services across the board. Now, we do need that our health system function much more efficiently and equitably addressing all of the healthcare needs of the people. If not, 
as we have seen in the COVID pandemic, and as we have also noticed even before the pandemic, we accrue a large num amount of avoidable healthcare costs. We avoid, we accrue a lot of costs in, health, in terms of lost health, apart from the economic costs of lost productivity. We also incur a great deal of social costs in terms of people not being able to get the best of their education, not being able to acquire the right kind of employment and livelihoods. And all of these costs actually reflect upon the people as a whole, but much more so on the most vulnerable sections of our society, where multiple inequities combine to create not only ill health, but also poverty as a consequence of ill health. So we have a huge cost of unpreparedness of the health system when we cannot deliver the basic needs of the people, leave alone responding adequately and with urgency to the special needs of a pandemic. So what we need is that we create a health system which will be able to weather these storms, but at the same time deliver a large array of health services which are needed for everybody by way of an equitable universal health coverage led system, along with attention on the social determinants and environmental determinants of health. And of course, addressing even the commercial determinants of health. Otherwise we'll have an adverse impact, not only in the short term, but also in the medium and long term. If you look at what has happened in the course of the pandemic, it is very clear that there has been an adverse effect on child nutrition, on child immunization, antenatal care, institutional deliveries. And here we find that the most vulnerable populations are the most affected. When we have schools shut down with no midday meals being provided, when we have Anganwadi centers closed because of lockdowns or markedly restricted people mobility, neither are the preschoolers able to obtain the nutrition at the Anganwadi centers, nor are we able to provide other services that are needed even at the Anganwadi center. In terms of non-communicable diseases, we recognize that cancer care cardiovascular disease, renal dialysis, all of these have had significant adverse impact. Cardiovascular disease in terms of not only acute uh, cardiac events and acute cerebrovascular events, finding great delay in getting attention and timely treatment, losing a very valuable time for salvaging the jeopardized heart muscle or the brain. Those were major problems, but also we find that in terms of non-availability of the required medicines also became an important issue for people even staying at home. Then we have seen that as far as mental health is concerned, there has been a considerable amount of stress on people and people with mental health, compromised mental health would have been finding it extremely difficult to obtain the kind of services they need. And the pandemic would have even aggravated some of their vulnerabilities by the way of prolonged confinement, social isolation, and the fear of the pandemic harming them or their loved ones. Yet, there was very little possibility for them to obtain the needed care. Even in terms of communicable diseases, the treatment of tuberculosis, for example, which we had prioritized as a very important national priority, has indeed suffered in terms of lack of adequate follow-up. And of course, the fact that child immunization has suffered, we do not know exactly how many people have, actually, have suffered as a result of infections, which might have been otherwise avoided. Because one of the problems that we have seen in the time of the pandemic is that our data systems also have not very clearly cataloged 
the amount of deprived health services. But when we come to non-communicable diseases, one of the things that becomes abundantly clear is that while we have been looking at, or at least the policymakers and substantially the media were looking at non-communicable communicable diseases like COVID as an isolated entity and the pandemic being merely a viral onslaught on the body, what has not been adequately recognized in the beginning is that much of the morbidity and a great deal of the mortality is attributable to non-communicable diseases which have hitherto remained undetected or inadequately treated. And it is the coexistence of these morbidities, the comorbidities of several non-communicable diseases like diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, pre-existing uh, respiratory disease and chemotherapy and being immunocompromised and being compromised much more se severe manifestations of COVID and possibly even succumbing to it. But one of the other elements that the COVID pandemic brought out very vividly is that many of the people with non-communicable diseases have not even been detected by the system beforehand. When we say that people with comorbidities would be prioritized for immunization, then we ask for medical certification to show that they indeed have those comorbidities. Then quickly the realization came in that there are many people in the age group of 45 to uh, 60 we who were initially asked to produce these certificates who might not have been detected by the healthcare system, who might not be aware that they have hypertension or diabetes or may not have medical documentation to show it. And therefore, they would be deprived of the opportunity to get a vaccine if we insisted on the documentation. On making this plea, ultimately the government changed the policy and said, People above 45 need not produce this documentation. It's only people under 45 who need to produce the documentation. But even that was relaxed later on and said everybody above 18 can be covered. But it was a telling evidence that our system has been, uh, in a sense, deficient in its primary function of identifying people with non communicable disease related risk factors who are quite in large number, actually, even by the limited data that we have in terms of surveys, but not having them identified or not having them aware of their condition means not only they are much more vulnerable to uh, respiratory viruses, like, uh, particularly COVID, but also they remain deprived of an opportunity to get a vaccine on a priority basis, merely because they've remained in the, uh, in the, uh, on the blind spot of the health system. Now, if you really look at why this has happened, we recognize that we have had a limited infrastructure in our healthcare system, which was during the pandemic, substantially dedicated to COVID. This cannot be faulted because COVID was indeed a public health emergency. But when you have the services virtually diverted in terms of COVID hospitals or hospitals being designated as COVID hospitals and most of the beds being allocated to COVID and most of the limited health workforce being diverted to COVID duties, whether it is in primary health care or in secondary or tertiary health care, that immediately puts a great stress on health services that are required by people for other conditions and if those are not available then we have a major challenge in terms of deprived health services and aggravated health disorders with a considerable amount of resultant morbidity and mortality also possibly associated. We recognize that access became a big challenge not only because of lockdowns, but even because of the restricted travel conditions post lockdown and the limited transportation systems that were available by way of ambulances or even private 
uh, transportation services were being mostly taken up by the COVID patients. Affordability became a big challenge because people lost livelihoods, their incomes came down. And if you had a chronic non-communicable disease related condition, and if you had lost your job and income during this process, that would have been an extraordinarily difficult period for a person uh, to bear with. The quality of health services also would have been affected because most of the hospitals were now attending to non-COVID, uh, to COVID-related conditions and non-COVID-related conditions suffered. And so also elsewhere, even outside of hospitals, the primary health care services were mostly serving uh, the COVID patients. So you ultimately, you had to depend upon either quacks or on telehealth services. Telehealth services did serve a useful purpose, and they probably will come to stay in the future configuration of health services. Nevertheless, not having access to medical professional advice, and uh, or even in terms of a frontline health worker for conditions which are non-COVID would certainly have had a deleterious effect on health. We recognize that we do require to reconfigure our health services in order to really make them more capable and competent uh, to deal with all of these conditions, particularly if challenged by a public health emergency without neglecting other conditions. Therefore, if we are really looking at, for example, what we need to do, we do need to focus on enhancing our primary health care systems, particularly rural, but also urban primary health care systems. We need to improve our district hospitals, and we need to strengthen our medical college hospitals as well. Unfortunately, we have a highly neglected public sector and an unevenly distributed private sector. And these need to be addressed as we get back to the task of rebuilding our health systems. One of the areas of great deficiency has been lack of data. Even when we are discussing how other conditions have been adversely affected by lack of attention during the COVID period, we do not have very clearly reliable numbers to fall back upon. Leave aside the difficulties of finding out how many cases of COVID have been there, how many deaths because of COVID have been there, even in finding out how many people had heart attacks or strokes or how many people might have had other health-related conditions which are non-COVID, we do not have that data, either very reliable data at baseline nor the impact of COVID on those services for comparison. Therefore, we do need much more reliable data systems which are real-time, representative and can be analyzed in a disaggregated manner so that we can actually have quick tracking and decision making. The slogan has been given that at the global level that we must build back better. I believe that what we need to do is to build forward better. We cannot go back to the past health system. We have to build forward with a much better health system so we need to build forward, we need to build better, we need to build broader because we do need a much stronger base of primary health care. And that needs to bring in all the elements of primary health care and a very comprehensive primary health care delivery system. And we need to build back fairer. We need to notice the health inequalities that exist even now, which existed before and which have been aggravated by COVID but we need to address in our reconfiguration of the health system the inequalities and bridge them as fast as possible. Therefore, we need to build back fairer as well. And for this, we do need to focus on primary health care because that is where the maximum benefits will lie. Even if you take universal health coverage and take the, uh, the cube that the World Health Organization has conveniently given us in three dimensions of population coverage, service coverage and cost coverage, then the maximum population coverage is going to be by universal health coverage in primary health care. Because almost everybody needs 
primary health care services at some point in time from delivery to uh, antenatal care to uh, childhood immunization to some kind of a uh, um, clinical care in older life. So everybody requires, whether it's for hypertension or diabetes, they would require primary health care services. At the same time, it gives you the broadest package of services. So service coverage component also is best addressed by primary health care. Then it is also the most cost optimizing. Therefore, even in terms of cost uh, coverage, the third dimension of the cube that the WHO provides, primary health care scores. So we do need to build in a very strong primary health care system. And we need to ensure that our shortages of workforce are addressed on a priority by having technology enabled, but not technology substituted health workforce. There's a considerable scope for technology and we must utilize it as best as we can. But there is also a false belief that technology will solve everything, that artificial intelligence will replace doctors, that robots will replace surgeons, and even frontline health workers can be replaced by smartphones. That is not going to happen. What we require is technology enabled, but not technology substituted uh, health services, health workforce. And even as we found out in COVID, whether it was for tracking of contacts or whether it is for registration for vaccination, you need people to contact people. You need both shoe leather and smartphones for epidemiology. So what we need are good teams who are constituted at different levels of healthcare, and we must ensure that there is very good community engagement. I'll come back to that later on. We need to strengthen our district hospitals. It will be a shame if our district hospitals do not promise to have adequate facilities for secondary care and some elements of tertiary care are even challenged on the grounds of assuring oxygen when needed. So we must ensure that our district hospitals are strengthened and connected bidirectionally very well uh, to primary care. We also need to strengthen our medical colleges. But in terms of data, I believe that we do need to en ensure that we have real-time representative data which can be utilized at multiple levels with multiple levels of complexity of uh, data sets. In terms of the front line, right at the block level, you ought to have a simple data set which can be readily recycled within the block itself for analysis and decision making. Then at the district level, you ought to have a more expanded data set which is useful for supportive supervision and any course corrections that may be required. Uh, but at the state level and at the national level, what we require is a much more elaborate data set for resource allocation and then for re uh, uh, revising the strategies as may be required. So therefore, we do require to invest in very good data collection systems, but those data collection systems must be quite valid in terms of their data collection methods, representative and real time. And they must also be disclosed to the public. We cannot have data secrecy, particularly if we ever have to have citizen engagement on a broad level with the healthcare system. So we need to have a lot more data transparency, not merely for challenging of data by others, but also for utilization of data by bringing the best of our talent into data analysis. And that will only help us much better in terms of our the manner in which we can actually deal with this. Then I believe what we really require is also a much more democratization of our health system, in, uh, particularly at the level of the primary health care. The 15th Finance Commission has said that it's going to allocate the resources for primary health care to the local bodies, to the panchayats, and to the urban local bodies. Now. It is a very good idea. It has been there before, but now the resources are going to flow much more directly to them. But are they capable of making the right decisions in terms of priorities? 
I believe it is absolutely essential for us to work with the local bodies and to ensure that they have a proper familiarity and understanding of the nature of health challenges that India faces and what are the nature of health challenges that are there in their locality by way of disaggregated data presentation and then also infuse that priority for equity in them so that the right kind of priorities can be identified for local action and also for equitable service provision. So that is where there is a huge responsibility that rests on people in public health and health services in order to engage much more constructively with the panchayats and the municipal local bodies. And that's something that we need to address. As far as the private sector is concerned, uh, it is very much there. We have a mixed health system that is evolved by default and not by design. But since it exists substantially and has a considerable amount of clientele and influence, we need to bring it into the ambit of universal health coverage in a constructive manner by ensuring that its participation is on the basis of very clearly defined deliverables and accountability mechanisms. We do need that the private sector strengths and limitations are also recognized by the policymakers. For example, there was too much trust put in during the COVID period when it did appear that in terms of services, they did re render some services, but we also saw how even the best of private hospitals ran short of not only oxygen, but also of the required health workforce and other required support systems. But more importantly, we saw how the vaccines that were allocated 25% of the private sector could not be delivered because of the paucity of presence of suitable private sector entities to deliver the vaccines in two tier and three tier, uh, second tier and third tier cities and villages. Much of the vaccine stock by remaining back with them. Similarly, even with the Pradhan Mantri uh, Aragi Yojana, Jan Aragi Yojana PMJ, we found that the accreditation of these hospitals in uh, two tier and three tier cities was much less than expected. And therefore, again, the penetration of that scheme into those areas remained inadequate. So we must recognize the strengths of the private sector. We must recognize the limitations of the private sector as it exists. But then with a strengthened public sector in a much more capable position, we ought to be able to bring in partnerships as appropriate so that we can utilize all of our societal services, but within the framework of a well-defined universal health coverage system. And for that, we do require a single payer system, which is portable across the country. And that's something we have to be able to create it with a predominantly tax funded universal health coverage system. We ought to create networks of healthcare providers at each level of care, primary, secondary, and tertiary, and between levels of care, and ultimately move towards a bundle payment or a capitation uh, mode of payment so that we uh, eliminate over a period of time the fee for service, which is not really efficient or cost effective and can be uh, a generating a lot of induced demand. But while doing all of this, we must ensure that the most vulnerable people are the people best protected by the system. Equity has two dimensions. One is horizontal equity where everybody gets the same service which is where the essential health package comes in. But there is also vertical equity, which is where we are doing preferential, providing preferential services, additional resources, and maybe even much more subsidized costs when required for people who have suffered a lot of health inequities in the past. And those vulnerable sections must be provided the additional protection through some additional targeting. Targeting as a as a general principle of universal health coverage is very wrong, but you must have horizontal equity supplemented by vertical equity in order to bridge the health equity gaps. And that's where people like migrants and others become very, very important for our attention uh, even during this period. And portability of care becomes very important where 
people should not feel whether because they have moved because of employment issues or educational issues from one part of the country to another country, another part of the country, they're going to be deprived of needed health services. We do need community engagement, which is going to be much more extensive. And there the example of health assemblies, which are there in Thailand and in Brazil, very important. We need the community participation in agenda setting of health priorities in the delivery of the health programs and also in monitoring of the health programs and that level of community participation is absolutely critical if we want to build an efficient and equitable health system but it's also very important and i'm very happy that this particular conclave is addressing the other determinants of health i see there is a topic that is there on one health that is very important because we recognize that whether it is zoonotic communicable diseases or a number of non-communicable diseases which come from excessive animal meat consumption or environmental consequences of our deranged food and agricultural systems. All of these are actually related to the manner in which we are configuring our developmental paradigms around a number of distorted patterns, particularly in terms of uh, livestock breeding, also unplanned urbanization, extensive deforestation, and our food systems, which are dangerous for us. And if climate change pushes ahead, we know that we are going to suffer a lot in very many ways, it's not only because we are going to be seeing many direct impact of climate change in terms of extreme weather events, uh, vector-borne diseases, water-borne diseases, and heat effects, but also our food and nutrition is going to be greatly affected by climate change. For in South Asia and Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, for every one degree centigrade rise in temperature, we will suffer a 10% decrease in the production of our staples. Not only in quantity, but also in quality, we will be suffering quite a lot. It has been postulated by the data science, it's been a model by the Data Science Institute of the Columbia University, that if the present patterns continue, by 2050, India would have 49.6 million more new zinc deficient persons, 38.2 million new protein deficient persons, 396 million iron deficient women, and 106.1 million iron deficient children. So what we really require to understand is we are dealing whether in health itself or across health in its links to other systems that we are dealing with multiple complex adaptive systems. And in order to deal with this uh, complex adaptive systems, linear thinking will not do. So what we really require is to understand complexity science, build multidisciplinary partnerships for knowledge creation and multi-sectoral platforms for action. And that is where I hope uh, this particular uh, conclave will lead us to because the challenges are very many. We have recognized the deficiencies of our health system. And particularly, we have noticed how non-COVID conditions have suffered great neglect. But we have also recognized that we need to rebuild much better and learn from what we have experienced during COVID. But we need to ensure that we maintain that bifocal vision in which we see the full expanse of all the health conditions that need to be provided care for, at the same time ensuring that all the determinants of health which lie outside of the health sector are also addressed in unison. And I hope this particular platform is, is going to be very effective in building the kind of partnerships we need in order to commit, uh, in order to uh, ensure that we can transfer our commitment into achievement. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Reddy. Uh, I request Dr. Shailendra Hegre, Senior Vice President and Head Public Health Innovation, Pyramal Swasta, to introduce the entire health track and also summarize the discussion uh, by the keynote speaker, Professor Reddy. And there are some chat, uh, there are some questions on the chat box. I request you to take that as well. Uh, Dr. Yeah. I was taking a brief minute to introduce you, uh, 
So Dr. Hegre is a medical doctor with specialization in public health and preventive medicine from St. John's Medical College. He also specializes in management of international organization from University of Geneva, Switzerland. Over to you, Dr. Hegre. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Reddy. I think uh, we can go on listening to the wonderful uh, way you speak, the way you very simply put some of the most complex issues. Uh, I think uh, to summarize what you've said is, is just too much of a task in the limited time that we have. There are a couple of very interesting questions, sir, which I think I will, with the, with the available time that we have, I think at least one or two questions you may want to sort of touch upon. So I'm just going to pose one, uh, one important question. Uh, and this is something that we probably, all of us are asking not just as uh, medical professionals or healthcare professionals, but as citizens as well, as are we doing uh, enough in terms of capacity and infrastructure to prepare for the third wave? Uh, or is it another disaster to waiting to happen? So I think that's a question that many of our uh, colleagues have asked. Well, uh... Whether we are going to get a third wave of a large magnitude is dependent upon a number of factors. How well we are implementing our public health measures for containment of transmission, our improvement of our able, uh, systems for early detection and isolation and contact tracing if the third wave starts, our ability to detect the emergence of new variants within the country or entry of new variants from outside, and then, of course, how capable are our healthcare systems in responding to the challenge. Sure. Now, I believe some of these areas are showing some improvement. Uh, surveillance systems are improving a bit, but our primary healthcare systems are not still fully engaged. Uh, our laxity in uh, observing public health measures is still showing up now because people are again being lulled into complacence by believing that uh, they're uh, going to have herd immunity, which is a false perception. Uh, immunization, which is the other element that should be pushed, is still rolling out a bit slowly. Hopefully, it will pick up uh, pace uh, from September. But I believe, at least in terms of preparing hospitals a little better in terms of oxygen, equipment, and supplies, there a considerable amount of attention has been given. And there we may not do as badly as we did in the second wave. But uh, rest of it, particularly in terms of primary care, assisted, supervised and supported home care, contact tracing and some of the other public health functions of primary care systems. And of course, people readiness to observe uh, COVID appropriate behavior. There are still a lot of deficiency that we need to correct. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I think uh, this has uh, very nicely kickstarted the entire uh, Charcha 2021 uh, the forgotten amidst the pandemic theme uh, that we've taken for the health track. Uh, as you all know, Charcha is one of the biggest annual virtual meetings of the development sector, where thought leaders, experts, practitioners of the development sector and citizens come together to discuss ideas and issues which are most pertinent in current times. The sessions, uh, as Dr. Reddy was also referring to, are segmented into very different tracks, but are somehow all related to the social determinants of health. Uh, there is health, there's education, there's gender, the skill development, philanthropy, and, and so on and so forth. Each track has been co-hosted by a different organization. Piramal Swastya is co-hosting the health track. Um, unfortunately, uh, we do not have much time to sort of give a complete uh, download around what are all the topics that we are going to discuss. But over the next three days, uh, we will be looking at about uh, seven sessions that are all focused on healthcare. The next session, which starts in another 10 minutes, uh, is basically going to talk about specifically on how are we going to recognize differences and how are we going to address those differences. We then look at mental health related issues later in the evening at six o'clock. And then tomorrow, as Dr. Reddy was also mentioning, we touch upon a very important topic, which is one health approach. We also then uh, follow it up with non-communicable diseases. And then we, talk, we take a, an important topic, which has been uh, a sort of a taboo for a very long time, which is the uh, menstrual health and menstrual hygiene related issue. 
Uh, we then end on 15th of August. Uh, we talk about rights versus responsibilities. Um, and going by the adage, no one is safe until everyone is safe. I think we are going to end the entire track uh, with that particular session of rights versus responsibilities. With that, I, uh, I open the health track uh, after listening to this wonderful session by Dr. Reddy. Thank you, sir. Uh, it was a pleasure having you on this particular panel, this particular discussion and uh, starting off this particular session. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, please join in at the four o'clock session on recognizing the differences. Sudeshna, over to you. Uh, yes, thanks all of you. It's at 4.05. Uh, please join the track for session two. We will also be joining you soon. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. for being there. Thank you, sir. Thanks, sir. Thank you.